film critic. So I married a Welcome to So I Married a Film Critic, a discussion between a professional film critic and lecturer and me, his wife of 20 years, who just likes to watch movies for fun. I'm your co-host, Julia. Hey everyone, this is Barry, the film critic. You can actually see us during this episode if you so choose. If you want to, we're on YouTube. If you don't want to, we're still on all the podcast channels. So This episode is also in 3D, so if you have your 3D glasses, put them on. That ice pick will be coming right at you. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah, because we're talking about basic instinct. Because when you think summer film, I'm sure the first one you think of is basic. No, it's not. <laughs> Never. <laughs> but no, we, we thought like, hey, let's let's come back. We've taken a little break. This is season three of this show, I think. Who knows? Whatever it is. So yeah, we've taken a break and we thought, Let's really come back with a heavy hitter. Let's talk about one of the most discussed films of the 1990s, one of the definitive erotic thrillers, one of my favorite films from Paul Verhoeven, and a film that is uh, not subtle. I thought you were going to say one of the most disgusting films. No, no, not at all. And I was going to say, well, that first scene. No, I don't think it's disgusting. I mean, I think the movie uh, goes over the line. (laughs) Um, but, uh, no, I've always had kind of a grudging respect for this movie. And as I get older, I I like it a little more every time I see it, even though we reviewed the unrated cut of this film, uh, which is the version of the movie. I once showed my film noir class at the university of Colorado, uh, Colorado Springs. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that was not, the thing was, this was back when I was teaching classes with video cassettes and my video cassette of the original r-rated cut of basic instinct um it was not great it was not in good shape at all oh. clearly a lot of people had watched it and paused it if you know what i mean not me i was a used copy oh you don't you wouldn't you never did that never no oh. no 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 come on come on no so <laughs> um so i was stuck with the unrated dvd and i warned my students i said this is not the version i wanted to show you this is really rough um and as as you and i saw we watched the x-rated cut of this movie it's unrated but it's technically an x that's what the movie got before they cut out some stuff and we'll talk about the distinction between the two versions um there's a lot to discuss here i hope you're interested this is uh you know this is i don't know if people still love this movie embrace this movie but i mean it's one of the most controversial films ever made and a lot yes a lot and a lot of those reasons do hold up too Mm. so okay you go well, we're coming in hot this time. Coming in hot. Let's get into it. Okay. I kind of wish I had a nice pick because then I could like show everyone what it looks Let's like. Let's make it really gimmicky <laughs> this show. Yeah. <laughs> because do you know anybody who has a nice pick? Have you ever I've seen never met one anyone? Never, never seen one, never held one in my life. No. Yeah, um, Ice Cube. I'm an Ice Cube Trace. I mean, and they've, because initially my mom had some that were metal. And then, you know, now they have them plastic. If, I mean, do people even use ice cube trays anymore? Well, yeah, I've I never, mean, but I've never do, seen people but... like use an ice pick to yeah. actually cut it's ice. Like... Especially in this movie. I mean, it's very, yeah. It's, it's... like the female psycho. Yeah, well, there's a lot of psycho in this movie. No question. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's get into it. So Johnny Boz. Oh, we're going right to the opening scene. Yeah. So let, well, let's, let's, let's set the scene. So. Okay. You know, this opening scene is just kind of like our life. They've they've got a mirrored, they got a mirrored ceiling. Oh, yeah. That's how I wake up every morning. I'm like, hi, you. <laughs> no. I, I, again, I've never seen a bedroom with a mirrored ceiling ever. Well, I have, but oh. I've never lived in a place with that. No, no. I had a is this friend. A confession? Oh, a friend. I had a friend, well, <laughs> a friend in college <laughs> who really liked the way he looked. Oh, that guy had one? Yes. Wow. Mm-hmm. I totally know who you're talking about. Okay. So I did not. <laughs> I never had a mirror anywhere in my room. <laughs> you're like, I don't I don't need to see this. I'm good. I know what I look like. <laughs> okay. So Johnny Boz is getting it on with this hot blonde gal. And the key is that we don't know, we don't see her face. We, we don't see that she face. has short blonde hair. They're both in very good shape. Uh, well, they're both yes. very enthusiastic about uh, what's ha- what's happening. Yes. Now, when we were watching this, you were like, "Okay, I'm spoilers." By the way, you were like, "I think I know who the killer is. I think it's the psychiatrist." Mm-hmm. And so I was like, "Okay, I'm gonna watch it, thinking maybe it's not Sharon Stone's character." Yeah. 
because I really wanted to see if that kind of changed how I saw the characters, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm really watching, <laughs> really watching the gal on top, if you know what I mean. And okay, you cannot see it. her You're face. You're not using euphemisms here. You're being very literal. <laughs> yes, it's a graphic sex scene. There's a lot of those in this movie. It's basic instinct, yeah. folks. Hold okay. on. But she, her hair is just like. Yeah. I mean, she, it's covering. Yeah, for those of you just listening to it, yeah, it's covering her face. What is she, a Muppet? Like, what is this hair doing? <laughs> I don't think either of them are really thinking about their hair at that moment. Well, that's true. So the only thing you can really see is her body, which, you know, is this is a really long scene. Yes. Yeah. Because it's the unrated cut. The R-rated um, cut, it was shorter. Okay. And the moment of impact, so to speak, <laughs> because it's they're about to both climax, uh -huh. and she grabs an ice pick from under the sheet and stabs him to death. Yeah. Originally, it was just like one or two stabbies, and he goes, <laughs> and they quick cut to the San Francisco Police Department showing up at the apartment. That was it. Here, I mean, she's clearly finishing as well as stabbing him to death it's, he's screaming and we get cuts of like the ice pick to his eye well it's rob Bottin, the guy who did the the effects for robocop and total recall yeah. so i mean that's a dummy of the actor you know they just made a dummy of him like <laughs> and she's just like stabbing the crap out of this dummy i mean it's it's gross no cgi folks it's no. gruesome yeah it's pretty yeah. bad and you know and very quickly you know the ratings association said okay you got an x Good job, guys. You know, good. You'll we'll, well, you'll never show this in a theater. They also because you know when the police department comes mm -hmm. you arrives. Know. Careful. <laughs> <laughs> wow, we are gonna get kicked off of YouTube. Well, you know what? On our first day, <laughs> all four of our our very devoted followers, all four of you. You know, some of you I've I've known for a very long time, and uh, I know you uh, you're you're like me. You're try to be very careful about language, and you also sometimes have kids like around where you listen to the show. So I'm trying to like keep it light, but this is a this is a sleazy film. It is. Yeah. It's a good movie, but it's crazy sleazy. <laughs> okay. Well, so when they arrive, they see his. Kroll the Warrior King just on full display. <laughs> That's true. That's the yeah. best way I can put it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For everyone. I love the euphemism you're using. Yeah. That everyone knows what I'm talking about. Yeah, I, I like that you you dipped over to how to lose a guy in ten Thank days. you. Was that set in San Francisco? No. Okay. New York. Okay, I try. I, I don't talk. So, anyways, was was that a dummy or is that I think so. Or is that just like Unless the actor? That poor actor, just like man, like it's there. cold in the studio, just laying yeah, here. I mean, I I was shocked a little bit. I was like, oh, it's there Paul it is. Verhoeven, though. I get it. It's Paul Verhoeven. All right. Yeah. All right. So we'll talk about that in a moment. So then we find out that the only suspect is Catherine Turamel, who is played by Sharon Stone, and she is a crime novelist who was the last person to be seen with Boz on the night that he died. So we're presuming that it is the blonde in the opening scene because, of course, similar hairstyle. Yes. <clears throat> yes. yes. So now we have Michael Nick, Douglas. Nick Curran. On the case. And what we learn quite quickly about him, though it's never developed particularly well, but I think it should, you know, the movie moves really well. It's a weird way of putting it. But we do learn that he is a recovering cocaine addict. IA is keeping an eye on him because he is known as Shooter because he accidentally killed two tourists. Yeah. That's a movie I want to see. And then <laughs> I know they keep bringing up this thing like you can hey, shooter. Tourists. But that shooter. And I'm like two tourists. Like wow, that's yeah, we'll we'll get into that, but like that's that's like a whole other thing. And then he had a wife who committed suicide because of the scandal surrounding him being the shooter. Mm -hmm. So there's a there's a lot of backstory that they quickly dump and it's fine because that's how it is in real life, you know. It's not like, you know, we typically don't go yeah, you know that one time I drove that bus over that old lady. You know, like, no, like we we typically don't like you know, talk about the most painful parts of our lives casually like that, you know. Um, so all that to say, like, I feel like 
there's <laughs> they're cramming a lot of of exposition in there just to establish that that Michael Douglas's character is this is film noir. He's an un, he's an unreliable protagonist. He's yeah. he's the lead in the film. He's not a good guy. No. He's not, you know, and it, and it gets worse. It gets so much worse. I know. So him and his partner, Gus. Played by George Zunza. Who I actually really liked in this. I liked him. Every time I see this movie, I like him less and less. Oh, really? I can't imagine these guys. What, like, like Gus is like a cowboy hat wearing, like, yeah. <laughs> and Nick is like, let's, okay, let's go. I mean, these guys are, I mean, they should have had their badges revoked a long time before oh. they ever got this far. All right, so they go over to Catherine's Pacific Heights mansion, and this is where they meet her girlfriend, I guess, lesbian lover, Roxy, who looks exactly like her. So Roxy, the thing is, yeah, so a few things. Roxy's established that she is Catherine Chamel's lover. She is a walking, talking red herring because, yeah, it could be her. Um and the character is a problem, and she's definitely one of the reasons this movie was so controversial, because when the script started to circulate, there were two things. One thing, it's like, okay, it's about gay serial killers. And this is a year after The Silence of the Lambs, so it's like, oh, we don't like this trend at all. Like, like okay, so, I mean, like, there really weren't a lot of gay characters, let alone, you know, gay actors, gay movies, and now it's like a, a bunch of gay serial killer movies. Yeah. So there's that, and then... The movie, okay, so like you wrote, let's say you write, wrote, past tense, you wrote the script for Basic Instinct. How much would you have sold it for? How much would I have sold it for? Yeah, go nuts. Okay, um, $500,000. So that's a great guess. And that would have been what a normal script would go for in 1992. The script for Basic Instinct sold for a record $3 million. Oh my. $3 wow. million. Dollars. So this thing back was- in the 90s? I mean, $3 million at this point, I mean, that could have funded like two Kevin Smith movies. Yeah. I mean, this, this don't is- Don't worry, I'll find out, you guys. You know I love this. So like the year before, the script, Shane Black's script for The Last Boy Scout sold for $1.75 million, also film noir, weirdly enough. And Basic Instinct, you know, which is by Joe Esterhaz, it's a, you know, like it's a gripping story. It is, but it's crazy sleazy. And it sold for a record $3 million. And people are going like, I can't believe you dropped that kind of money on the script. This is this is nuts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and like, seriously, like, Esther Haas is a good writer. He's written good movies. It's not that Basic Instinct isn't good, but I mean, this is sleazy. $7 million. Dollars. Today? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, seriously, that could... That, a lot of money. And, and this is when, you know, movies, even like romantic comedies were somewhere between like, you know, 10 to 15 million dollars so like for three million dollars it's like you could you could make a movie with three million dollars if you're kevin smith you can make three movies for three million dollars yeah so it's it's crazy so like even before they shot a frame of this thing it was controversial there were picketers i mean uh, you know right from the get-go it's like oh man michael douglas is making this this likely to be x-rated movie yeah mm. and and for a while it was better x Okay, so Roxy, like you said, is a little bit of a red herring. Yeah, I mean, the character is basically there for Michael Douglas to assert his manliness and to insult. Um, and Leilona Sorrell is a good actress. I, I, I'm i definitely on the side of people go like, it's really not cool the way this character is basically there to be a verbal punching bag for Michael Douglas. Yeah. And because it's, I mean, the thing is like, it's one thing like, look, like to be fair about this, it's cool that Catherine Trammell is so empowered. I mean, she is a walking, talking female empowerment. But like the character of Roxy should be established as like, this is my lover. This is my partner. No, I mean, Roxy is just like, she's basically, it's like either she's the killer or she's not. You know, yeah. she's only there. This is what I think. She's there is like, a, she plays it like she's a witch. Okay, but are they like the same age, you think? Or do you think Roxy's younger? I think the idea is that Roxy's younger, I think. Yeah, because we find out that Roxy is like a killer in her own right. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so for some reason, Catherine likes to be friends and lovers with murderers. Right. And because, but it's for her books. Right. It starts off that way. But then it's like she collects people. Mm -hmm. And so Roxy's kind of one of her collections yeah. And it's just turned into this really weird relationship where 
the, Catherine's not committed to her at all. And that's, and you know, and that's the thing. It's like, it's a, it's a missed opportunity. I, I, you know, I understand, you know, again, this is 1992. It's not like we're, you know, this isn't exactly a very, <laughs> what's the word? There's nothing politically correct about this movie. It's not like, like, let's, let's make her sensitive and get like, no, no, no. She's a walking, talking red herring. But the thing is like, if the movie had even one scene between the two of them having breakfast, oh one, yeah, just one scene, no. but no, like Roxy it's, is there as a sexual object. Yeah. She's there That's because she's I'm the saying. big bad lesbian. Yeah. It's like, oh my God, movie. Yeah. But again, this is 1992. No, but like, Catherine just uses her and then she makes excuses like, no, Roxy likes it like this. Like, we don't know that. Right. And it's all about the sex. It's not yeah. really about, yeah. You know, and again, it's like if the movie had established, for example, like maybe in Catherine Trammell being someone who has experienced so much loss in her life, maybe she reaches out to these women, not only because she's sexually attracted to them, but because it's like she wants to have this sisterhood. You know, it's like they get me because they yeah. understand loss. They understand tragedy. No, it's like these are my lesbian lovers <laughs> and yeah. they are possibly serial killers. Yes. That's it. That's like, it. OK. Like, oh, yeah. yeah, I understand why people picketed this movie. I get it. <laughs> OK, so Roxy sends our cops away. And so then they go to her ocean front house. And, and you know. And this is where I wonder how much does a novelist make in 1982 if you're if you're not Stephen King? She no, she got the money from her parents because they died. Remember? Yeah, but I mean, I, I mean, how much money? Yeah, no, she's like it's, a gazillionaire now. It's crazy because her parents were millionaires or yeah. something. We don't know how, but then when they died, they left her their fortune. Still, I mean, this is like Fort yeah. Knox money. Yeah. Yeah. No, they they were multi millionaires. So she she's probably made money from her books, but not like that kind of money. I mean, not Michael Crichton money. But I mean, I've seen Oprah's house. Ooh. It's not this spectacular. This is amazing. Well, your money went further back in the 90s. I guess so. <laughs> okay, so what did you think about their first meeting? I love it. At this point, you know, Sharon Stone is playing Catherine Trammell as the equivalent of Madonna, what Madonna was in the 1990s. If we remember, you know, it was before the erotica album that this movie came out, but it was at the point where, like, if we're talking about somebody who is... Was Madonna inspired by this movie? I don't... No, I doubt it. <laughs> I think Madonna was doing just fine with or without Basic Instinct. But, mm. I mean, that's the kind of pop culture feminism that Catherine Trammell exudes. It's like, she's like, I will sleep with whoever I want to sleep with. I'm, I am my own person. I am success. I do not need men. I do not need uh, permission. You know, this is who I am. Take it or leave it. And I love that Stone is playing it that way. Um, because that, again, like that's the kind of pop culture feminism that we had. I think she's playing it that way because she's truly a psychopath. I disagree. I think she's vulnerable. I think we can, yeah, but if she, she again, she's surrounded killer. by tragedy. If you want to think she's the killer, and I don't. I do. I don't. I'm going to say right away, I think she's the killer. No, I think I think you've been fooled no. by the psychiatrist, no. by Gene Triple. I think which we'll you've get to. been fooled. <laughs> no, I, you know, and I thought it was, I thought it was Sharon Stone as well. And by the way, I don't give a crap about Basic Instinct 2. I don't. Okay. The fact that that movie exists undermines this movie, but no, let's just pretend Basic Instinct 2 doesn't exist, which by the way, I think everybody who made that movie feels that way okay. about Basic Instinct All right. 2. So we discovered that Catherine has written a novel about a former rock star who was killed in the same way as Boz. Stabbed in bed with an ice pick with his hands tied together with a silk scarf. So this is what the all the policemen are talking about. Yes. And so then they're like, you And you got Stephen Tobolowski and Ned Ryerson. He's got some, I mean, I got a head, like, I love this character actor. He's got the close up and he's got like, we're dealing with a really sick individual here. <laughs> he's got like the money shot. Like, oh man, like he's the one who's telling us like, this is an evil individual. Yep. Whoever did this. Yeah. It's not Catherine Trammell, but whoever did this. We'll, we'll see. Okay. So they bring her downtown. Boy, do they ever. And, and right from the beginning, Trammell is messing with Nick. She's like, you know, do you want a cigarette? No, I don't smoke anymore. You will. Yeah. But before they even get in the car, she's getting dressed. And he can see her right. getting dressed. And I'm sure she that. was not aware of that at all. Uh, oh, yeah, right. <laughs> She's like, I'm just going to leave this door open. And he's not going to notice I'm not wearing any underwear. I go commando all the time. 
Yeah. So she puts on this like white dress with a white jacket. And if you, you know, know the scene, folks, you know the scene. Yeah. So during questioning, um, Catherine engages in some provocative behavior. Oh, so we're at the interrogation scene yeah. now. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, yeah. so let's talk about a few things. Jean DeBont shot this movie. This is the guy who went to direct uh, Speed just two years later, as well as Twister and Speed 2 Cruise Control, his greatest film. <laughs> Jan de Bont, I gotta say, he's a terrific cinematographer, and the editing of this movie was Oscar nominated, and let's talk about the Jerry Goldsmith music. This is my favorite Jerry Goldsmith score, because the main theme is very tender, but the the score is like, it's all over the place. At times, it's very, it's scary. At times, it's really exciting. But this interrogation scene, for all the things about it there that are really infamous, um, I think it's fantastic filmmaking. I love the way it established that you know, Catherine, she has the high ground literally from these from these cops, but she's also in total control of the room. Yeah, and oh, she's total loving cat it. and mouse and it, situation. And, and look, I know everyone's like, but then she uncrosses her legs. That's the scene. That's the moment in the scene that makes it infamous. And I'm not saying like it, it isn't scandalous, of course. And in 1992, there were a few moments that were more scandalous than this. But the scene is about performance. It really is. And it's not just the nudity. Um, I love, I, I really, because like, these lines are very tawdry. Mm -hmm. You know, for a $3 million screenplay, this is a sleazy film. But it's also film noir. It is. And it's, it's, there's, it's, this is kind of this weird, it's like, it's, it's, uh, it's scuzzy, but it's also elegant, weirdly elegant. And I, I find this scene to be just really riveting to watch. And has everything to do with performance. And there's also some nudity. Who's the guy who's in the movie that you never like? Oh, Wayne Knight? Yeah, yeah. Because he's just like, and they're like, oh. <laughs> he just cannot handle it. He has no. one note. And he plays it like, okay, Wayne Knight, you're going to sweat profusely. <laughs> yeah. The minute you see Sharon Stone, just just gawk. Just, just gawk. do that. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're supposed to be a professional police officer but we're just gonna throw it out the window it's like you're in a porky sequel and you're like you know in the locker room play it that way yeah looking through like a people yeah that's that's all he does so uh <clears throat> did you ever uh, time up <laughs> so sweating ah <laughs> uh, newman and the way that she talks to nick i mean i think gus or one of the other guys he says like do you guys know each yeah. other <laughs> yeah it's a really good like psychological situation what do you think about michael douglas's performance in the film do you like it yeah i do like it i think he like starts off really even keeled and then she what she does to him he just goes full unhinged by the end yeah because in the early scenes is established he is basically he's getting his life together for the first time you know he's mm. he's sober i think for like a, a couple weeks he's seeing his psychiatrist but it seems like it's a fairly healthy relationship even though you, there's a big conflict of interest there but it's still it's like you know he's he's getting over grief he's getting over drug addiction mm -hmm. he's straightening up as a cop and of course minute by minute that he spends with Catherine Trammell, it all goes out the window. Exactly. He's smoking within minutes of meeting her. He's, <laughs> he's at the bar. Yeah, like it all goes out the window. Okay, well, let's talk about Dr. Garner, Jean Triplehorn. Jean Triplehorn. I love her performance in this, yeah. Because she's, you know, his psychologist, but also they dated. So there's a little bit of like, Oh, I don't know if she should also be a psychologist. No, but I think that also speaks to how she is in control of everything. And when they're when they are talking about the evils, talking talking about the moral implications of Catherine Tremell, if she is the killer or whoever the killer is, there's all these cuts to her, these reaction shots that are really creepy. Okay. Because she's the killer. No, I was watching for that, and there were times when they could have cut to her and they didn't. Like they should have. But there are moments where they like do. That. She gives a little side eye. It's 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 chilling. It's there. I've it's there. I'm not. <laughs> I've seen this movie a few times. Okay, <laughs> when my mom wasn't home, I watched this movie quite a lot when I was in high school. Okay, well, oh, twice, oh, twice I've seen. Okay, I didn't see it in the theater. I was too young. No one would take me. 
<laughs> oh yeah, I definitely didn't see this in the theater. You know, I gotta say, like the I had a friend named Richard Crawford. He was the owner of the theater that played it uh, in Kahului, where I grew up and went to high school. Richard Crawford had a sign over the door saying, "This movie is rated R, but I am not allowing anyone under seventeen. You have to show your ID. I'm not no kids, no teenagers." I, mean, that's... I, I, I thought, wow, man, that's like you're because you know, like. You're cutting because you know there's going to be a parent's like, well, I got my three kids and I just couldn't find a babysitter. Like he was like, no, I kind of admire that, and yeah. it clearly worked. I mean, the thing played at that theater for like a month; it was sold out all the time. Because I remember walking by, like, I want to see Busy Gitsting. Mom's like, no, we'll go see Ladybugs. You little monster. I love Ladybugs. <laughs> I'm not kidding; they played at the same time. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, you need something for every demographic. So. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So I got stuck seeing ladybugs. I'm like, man, if I can only go across town and see that ice pick movie. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about how now the internal affairs investigator is making life hard for Nick. And so yes. he basically forces Gene Triplehorn's character to like sign off on his paperwork. Yeah. Right. And then it's the exciting part of Basic Against Think, the, the paperwork, the <laughs> bureaucratic part. It's the part everyone remembers. <laughs> okay but there's like a scene where they go they're in a bar together yes okay and there's like this fight that happens between nick and the ia guy yeah and then her and nick leave together mm -hmm. and then go back to her apartment yeah and this is um this is a rough scene this is another scene that was originally part of the x-rated cut and unfortunately you and i watched the x-rated version the other night i swear i don't watch a lot of x-rated movies with my wife but this was the only version of basic instinct i had my vhs copy was a little little hazy so in the theatrical cut it's like this moment of passion between them and it just becomes this very ferocious sex scene in the unrated cut it's clearly established it's date rape he date rapes her Mm -hmm. and then afterwards she says you know this is something you've never done before in the theatrical cut it's like it's almost like this you know like this eyebrow raise moment, like this is something you haven't done before but because we see oh yeah it's because obvious. it's a really brutal violent moment yeah. um it's like oh my god like yeah she's calling him out like he's he he's a monster mm -hmm. yeah yeah so it's just really yeah but you can now this might be weird, but uh -oh. <laughs> the, the reason I did think it was possibly her is because her and Sharon Stone almost look identical naked. Yes, yes. I think that's part of they did have not to be salacious, but yes, they do have very similar body types. I think that is intentional. I think it's like did they just decide like, hey, we have to cast these actresses I'm sure. because they look yeah, yeah. the same. Yeah, but, well, I mean, you've got one big scene where you see the killer in plain view. So yeah. because of that, it's like, yeah, we have to have two actresses who, other than the hair color, they could be the same person. Yeah. And later on, you see Gene Triplehorn used to be a blonde. So it's like, okay, this it really could be. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, I, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, obviously the casting director had a lot of fun with this. <laughs> Gotta make sure, okay. Sure, they're the same. Concept. Just make sure before we cast you, just yeah. Mm -hmm. As you can imagine, a lot of actresses turned the role down of Catherine Tramell. A lot of great actresses. Sharon Stone was kind of, she was in Paul Verhoeven's prior movie. She played um, Arnold Schwarzenegger's wife in Total Recall. Mm. So that was a big break for her. And she had a good working relationship with Verhoeven. She did this film. She wrote a book about it a couple of years ago, talking about the things about the movie she regrets and also how this movie completely launched her. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Nick, this is where Nick learns that Catherine's parents were killed in a boating accident and left her their fortune. So she was an adolescent when this happened. Yes. And then we find out that one of her college counselors was stabbed in his sleep with an ice pick when Catherine was attending UC Berkeley. And her former fiance, who was a boxer, was killed in the ring during a prize fight. So we find out like all these people in her life have died in really random ways. Or not so random ways, as we find out that Johnny Boz, the rock star, he received 31 stab wounds. I think the movie only showed like the first 12. And he was found with cocaine on his lips and penis. Oh, man. <laughs> it's basic instinct, folks. 
<laughs> Sorry, this is not the Care Bears movie. We'll be covering that next week. This is Basic <laughs> Instinct. Okay, then we also learned that one of Catherine's best friends, Hazel Dobkins, she was a is a woman who stabbed her husband and children for just no reason. Yes, played and- by the great uh, film noir actress Dorothy Malone, making a very strange comeback in this almost silent role. Yeah, yeah. like this character has basically no dialogue and just shows up randomly throughout the film. Yeah, it's... It's, I, I think it's fascinating, but again, it's like it's a missed opportunity not showing us. I mean, you know, it, it obviously it would be a real clue as to the inner workings of Tremel. I mean, she's a real mystery. We only see her through Nick. Do you think she, like, that Hazel is a mother figure or a lover figure? Both. Ew. <laughs> it's Catherine Tremel. She's sexually free. She does what she wants. Yeah, but that's weird. Yeah. Like, if she sees her as both of those things, a mother and a lover, that's what I'm talking about. Well, I don't know. The film does not tell us. Okay. But in any case, she obviously has an emotional intimacy with Hazel Dobkins, which yeah. is how she's able to use her as a subject for her books. I mean, I I, I don't know. Does, does, does Tremel ever not have a sexual relationship, you think? But again, like it's a mystery because we, we only know. see the character through Douglas. And Douglas only sees her in this masculine view, you know, which is why everyone who is not, you know, everyone's a competition for her, for him. Right. So. That's yeah. true. Okay. Now at one point. I'm starting to sweat like, like <laughs> Wayne Knight in that movie. <laughs> oh man. Talking about basic instinct. Yeah. Have a drink of water. <laughs> It'll be okay. Oh man. When's this interrogation going to end? <laughs> okay. So. During a visit to her house, Catherine reveals through she uses ice picks to cut her ice, which is wow. Well, she does. Have you ever seen that in a movie? I have. And like, no, that's that's wild. She's like, I like the rough edges. Like, and she, I gotta say, like, you know, Sharon Stone, excellent, excellent ice cubage. Whoever trained her, how to like, because it's hard. Well, it's slippery. I assume. So what is she just going to the store and buying blocks of ice? Blocks of ice. And yeah. Just keeping that in her freezer? Like she has space for that? I mean, this is San Francisco. So she's going down Lombard Street and she buys these blocks of ice and she hefts them back up to her mansion. Oh my God. I thought that must that was so heavy. Yeah. Yeah, I know she's tough. That's she how she stays makes, in shape. She probably makes Roxy do it. Yes. Because that's something she would do. No, I was going to say that she taunts Nick with information that should be confidential because she got it from the IA guy. Right. Yeah. She has like elements of his file, uh, Mm -hmm. things about private things that she knows. She taunts him with uh, information about his late wife. Yeah. Yeah. So he gets on Beth's case for giving the file out. Yeah, I love this because this is where Douglas's performance becomes very unhinged. There's a moment between him and Sharon Stone where she's coming like nose to nose with him. It's kind of a seduction, but then she's laying out all this creepy stuff about him that she knows. And his reaction is, (laughs) (laughs) I love it. There's probably like a monologue there. He's like, what if I just scream at her? So then, Ah. yeah, the next scene he busts into Gene Triplehorn's office and he's tearing it up. Love it. But this is, so then he threatens Nilsen, the IA guy. Yes. And later, um, Nilsen is found dead. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In his car. And so it's like, okay, now Nick is the prime suspect in this investigation. Right. It didn't take very long. Yeah. So now he's like in more trouble when he's trying to get his life back together. Yeah. Thanks, Catherine Trammell. She is becoming a character for her book as she establishes. And she tells him this from start to finish. That's the, that's maybe the one thing about the character that's interesting that is so consistent is like she meets him and she says immediately, you're going to be a character in my book. I'm going to love writing about you. I'm going to love having you in my book. Yep. And it's a she, murder mystery. She's yeah. About a guy who falls in love with the wrong girl. She kills him at the end. She tells yes. him that immediately. Yes. Yeah. He should be running in the other direction. No. You can't resist the danger. (laughs) I know. So now they're just having an affair and um, yeah. 
<laughs> that's well going on. Uh, well, I mean, the, let's not skip over some some good parts. Okay. Okay. Let's talk about the disco scene, the discotheca scene. Yes. Okay. This is great. The, I love this scene. This part is crazy because Catherine is like, "Well, I kind of like it that you're following me." Right. And she's like, "I'll be at this disco, you know, later. See you there." And, and I love it. Like, in Nick Curran, to his credit, isn't like, "I can't dance. I wouldn't be caught dead at a disco." Yeah. Disco's dead. It's ninety-two. No, he's like. Disco, you got it. I'm going to be there. See you there. Yeah, it's yeah. like midnight, right? Yeah. Yeah. So he goes and Catherine and Roxy are doing drugs in the bathroom and then, you know, like making out on the dance floor. And then he starts dancing with Catherine. And this part where Roxy is dancing with someone else, but it's like not Can you really. you illustrate for us? For yeah. those of us watching it, this. It's crazy. She's. Hey, let's do it. Okay. So no, no. The guy is like this and I'll she's like this, like going back and forth, looking at Catherine and like just making eye contact with her. Yeah. And the whole time you're just seeing her like bob and weave, like <laughs> it's like like man, like Leilani Sorrell could have been one of the Watubi brothers in Night at the Roxbury. She could have been like, yeah, it's yeah. it's great. And it's so funny. Nick's wearing like a sweater. Yeah, because when you go to a discotheque, that's what you wear. I love this scene. I think it's visually stunning. I love the music in this scene. Like, and I gotta say, when I got older, and I actually did go to like a late night dance club in Denver, so disappointing. Like, man, I saw a base against thing. I know what this should be. This is not it. This is lame. Because <laughs> it was a goth club too. So like, everyone's dressed like a vampire, and I'm wearing like an Aloha shirt. <laughs> hey guys. <laughs> And then you start doing this. Yeah, right. Do the bob and weave. No, uh -huh. people just want to stand around and just like stare at the ceiling. Oh, this, no, this sucks. Wow, babe. That, yeah. I can't imagine you in that yeah, situation. Yeah, I can't imagine me at a goth uh, <laughs> nightclub either, but it happened. It did happen. Well, so then a jealous Roxy tries to run Nick over with her car. Yeah, understandable. Totally. I get it. And uh, he doesn't know that it's her kind of chasing him and then do we jump because wait a minute from the from the dance club mm -hmm. that's the second big sex scene oh well yeah yeah okay. which was like again it was like two and a half minutes theatrical cut which is already long the version we saw was long oh, it goes on yeah, for yeah. A while. where roxy is like where, where afterwards like, she likes to watch yes and then afterwards he has that uncomfortable moment with roxy where he basically belittles her and you know people have yes. said it's like very you know uh very homophobic let me address that for just a second okay. i'm not excusing this movie for this stuff this stuff that was offensive in the 90s the stuff that's very dated and problematic now but if there's one thing i would say that does not let the movie off the hook but i think uh what am i trying to say everybody in this movie is awful Definitely. everybody the only characters in this movie who are worse than the gay serial killers are the straight people <laughs> They're terrible. Everybody in this movie is awful. Nick is disgusting. Uh, Beth is compromised at best. The part, every all these cops, everybody in this movie is is. There's really no terrible. hero. No, which is what again, but that's what makes it film noir. Yeah. It's it's a world where like the main character needs to redeem himself and he's just falling further into the gutter. The main character is in love with a femme fatale. The femme fatale uses sex as a weapon. First and foremost, she is the one with all the cards. She is empowered. I mean, that's like it's classic film noir. There's scenes in Beth's office where there are uh, a shadowy lines across the characters. It's like they already got the prison bars around them. Mm. It's symbolic, but it's also a bit of foreshadowing. This movie, it's very like, you know, it's it's not vertigo because vertigo is very elegant. And this movie is basic instinct, but it it is like like for what look, Hitchcock was always pushing the envelope. I think he would have loved to have made a movie like this. He would have loved to have made a movie this dirty, this out front. No, really. I mean, Hitchcock, Hitchcock was pushing the envelope towards then. He made a movie called Frenzy, which was also about sexual violence. In a way, Psycho and Vertigo are also about sexual violence. Mm -hmm. So you know, and and certainly Brian De Palma, who kind of picked up the torch after Hitchcock left, this Brian De Palma with Dress to Kill and uh, uh, Body Double. He was making movies that are kind of foreshadowing what this movie is. Um, 
I don't know. Like for me, film noir, there's a classic detective quality to it. And this movie, you know, it's like, it has that, but it's also like, let's push the envelope in every way. Mm. Um, some of it works because, uh, because I, for, I love how unhinged this movie is. I mean, it's, it's Paul Verhoeven. This is a Dutch superstar. I love this filmmaker. He made RoboCop. He did a film in 83 called The Fourth Man, which was kind of like a tryout for this movie. It's a very similar film. There's a, It's about a scissor killer, not an ice pick killer, a scissor killer. And there's a scene in that movie where a guy loses his penis with the scissors. Uh. Yeah. Fourth Man, rent it tonight. <laughs> So anyway, like, I, I don't know, like Verhoeven is just not subtle. I mean, what did he do after this? He did Showgirls. Oh, and yeah. after Showgirls, he did Starship Troopers and Hollow Man. And he's still like, he he did a, he did an erotic nun movie a couple years ago called Benedetta. He's in his eighties. I love this guy. Like he, <laughs> he just, he's not interested in being censored. He is not interested in subtlety. His movies are violent. They are nasty and they are personal. Um, I love this guy. So like, look. Like if you're going, man, I'll listen to this podcast, but I'm never seeing this movie. Okay, but like, I just I like that there are people just who make watch movies. The unrated version. Just watch the theatrical version. Well, like it's so much. Oh come on! <laughs> like, well, the R-rated version they could show on Disney Plus, <laughs> but the X-rated version. No, no, no. The R-rated version is still really. Yeah. No, it's still true. it's a very it's a rough movie. It is, but you know if if you're if you're intrigued, I gotta say, like a lot of that sleazy stuff aside, I find the mystery really intriguing. Oh I yeah, think it's a really, it's a really riveting good movie. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess I'll, I'll jump really quick. When I showed this movie to my college class years ago, and hopefully some of them are watching right now. Hi, if you remember that class. The thing I remember at the end of the year, one of my students said, "I loved your film noir class. I'm so sick of sex scenes." Because we watched Basic Instinct and Jade and Body Heat and what else? Uh, Postman Always Rings Twice, like all these erotic thrillers. And yeah, I think afterwards they're like, <laughs> if I hear if I hear one more saxophone and watch one more person take their shirt off, You're not I'm so sick of these movies. Like Kenny G. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So then now we're to the point where Roxy is trying to run Nick off the road. Yes. Right? Yeah, because he just had dinner with his partner and admitted that he's already having an affair with Catherine. Yeah. yeah. So so Roxy tries to get... It, this is a riveting car chase. Yeah. This movie has two amazing car chases. One is out... It is uh, in the daytime where he's trailing Catherine, almost gets hit by a truck. It's yeah, a great scene. That's a really good scene. And this scene, oh, it's fantastic, where Michael Douglas, full tilt, is going, you want to play a role? <laughs> oh, love it. Love yeah. It. And then, then we find out that it was, Roxy, it was Roxy and she dies in this car chase. Yeah. So it eliminates Roxy as the main killer because it's like there's more killings that occur in the movie. And clearly it's not. It's not her. The late, great Roxy. But because we found out that uh, she killed her two brothers with a razor when she was a teenager. So. I would love to go to a Catherine Trammell party because you know you're going to meet somebody interesting there. <laughs> she does not invite the lame. You know, it's like, no, like. Yeah, but she... Do you remember this guy from Hard Copy? Remember this guy from A Current Affair? Yeah, let me introduce <laughs> you. Well, so did you think she was genuinely sad that Roxy was Yeah, I think killed? she's devastated. She, yeah. You know, I, I feel like she pulls these people in, not only because she uses them for a book, because like, but this is, this is her version of friendship, of intimacy. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't... It doesn't seem like Catherine has much in her social circle aside from the former killers that she likes to interview mm -hmm. so okay you know. well then this is when Catherine. it's kind of like the yaya -ya sisterhood but <laughs> sick <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> okay so Catherine reveals to nick in kind of a strategic way yes that she had a previous lesbian encounter in college that went awry with and of course nick is like i'm all ears yeah he's like tell me more with a gal named Lisa Hoberman and she became obsessed with Catherine and so she had to like cut it off with her and so yeah Nick's like and Nick's okay. just like red flag who's yeah. this girl this who threat Lisa yeah. I'm gonna figure this out yeah. and then he identifies Lisa as Beth 
Well, it's 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 interesting that the movie makes such a big deal about it. It's yeah. a lot of back and forth. He goes to the college, looks it up. We don't know who Lisa Hope uh, is. Yeah, it's this whole long sorry. Thing. So he goes back to so he goes back to his, Catherine oh, the next day and he's like, like Oberman. Oh, she and, and she's like Oberman with a B, you know. Yeah. That'd be like, hey, it's Barry Worst with a U. You got it wrong. <laughs> And of course he's like, ooh, okay. And he gets that. He's like, oh, now I have the real name. Yeah, yeah. And he gets the picture and it's Gene Triplehorn with blonde hair a couple of years earlier. And it's yeah. I mean, it's kind of an obvious reveal, but it's it's a nice shock because if anything, Gene Triplehorn seems like if if you know, if you're not like me and you think she's the killer, she does seem like the one nice person in this entire film. This movie is full of people who are mean, aggressive, abusive. Okay. And then there's Gene Triplehorn who's just like, I just want to have a nice relationship with this coke addicted, crazy <laughs> shooter cop. <laughs> okay. But do you think if she's not the killer, you think she's a nice person? Yes. Really? Yeah. Because I And that's how she's playing it. But there is a scene where she stands up for Nick after he's been interrogated he walks her to her car and he's like, you know, like, hey, I appreciate you, blah, blah, blah. And she gives him a smile and a wave. And as soon as he walks away, the creepy, crestfallen, yeah. icy face, which is like, yeah, the movie's telling us she's the killer. All right. Well, I have I have a Despite thought Despite what's that. in that last scene, and we'll talk about that ice okay. pick. Okay. So, all right. Now, we're kind of getting near the end. Okay, so Nick goes to Catherine's house and she is finished. She's done writing her book. Yes. And she's like, the book's over. Like, we're over. And at one point, she tells Nick, like, yeah, somebody has to die. Yes. At the end of the book. Mm -hmm. And he's like, why? She's like, oh, it's a murder mystery. Like, somebody always has to die. So then um, he sees the printer with the final pages of the book. Yep. Okay. And yeah. Okay. Yeah. This was your the first time you'd actually read it. Yes. And he reads okay. a few lines, you and he me. finds out that the fictional detective finds his partner lying dead, with his legs protruding from the doors of an elevator. Oh, finds his partner. Is that what it says? Something like that. Yeah, it's pretty okay. on the nose. So Catherine, um, she comes in and explains that she's finished her book, and just ends their affair. So, yeah. That this is like so if you're able to read what's in the final print of Catherine's book as it's being printed up, it's basically a precursor for the elevator scene that's coming up. Yeah. And you were like maybe she just wrote an elevator scene. She saw dressed to kill, like all of us, and she's thought, you know, I should end it with an elevator scene, which coincidentally is also how the movie ends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That checks out. Okay. Now, okay, now my theory is a little bit wonky because, because i was thinking but anything i think this straightens your theory that she's the one okay but my theory was like when she says no someone has to die yeah i was thinking maybe she decided she wouldn't kill nick because she is in love with him and she would kill his partner instead and he's the someone who has to die if only we liked his partner a little more i I don't dig this dude at all. No, I mean, that's fine. But like, why didn't she kill Nick? Like, and she have killed Wayne But Knight? why didn't she kill Nick? The Like she was saying she was going to. Because she would go to jail. Because they, because, I mean, she's seen with them. I mean, there's, there's, she can't cover it up. She can't cover it up. She doesn't have a walking red herring like Roxy anymore. Yeah, it's just her. Okay. We're running out of people to to suspect. Because that was my theory of why it was her, because she changed her mind about him. If she is a premeditative psycho killer, then yes, it absolutely makes sense what you're saying. That she like, okay, I choose his idiot cowboy partner to murder mm -hmm. as opposed to killing Nick. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Okay. But now, it, I mean, if this, if it really did say that his partner was lying dead in the book, I didn't like catch that. I think it says the partner. Okay. I'm pretty sure it does. So, so Gus was It'd a goner. No, messing with my head as well. But <laughs> so Gus was a goner the whole time. Yes. He gets in the elevator, and I gotta say, like, it's weird that the movie is stealing from Dress to Kill, which is Brian De Palma stealing from Alfred Hitchcock. So it's the so, one moment you're like, is it like guys. Catherine like stealing stories from other people? 
Yeah. And I got to say, like, at one point it's established that Love Hurts, you know, is a bestseller. I'm like, I want to hear that book on tape. <laughs> I really do. I don't want it read by Sharon Stone. <laughs> oh, okay. But so listen. All right. So Nick and Gus uh, have arranged to meet um, with Catherine's college roommate at a hotel to find out what really went on between Catherine and Beth. Yeah. So as Nick waits in the car, Gus enters the hotel elevator. And the reason he goes by himself is because technically Nick is like on, he's suspended. Yes. So yeah. it's a very contrived bit that he has to wait in the car while his partner goes to yeah. th- goes himself. It's it is suspenseful. You know, you got the close-ups of the of the the glowing number of the floor. It goes, you know, check things out, goes back into the elevator. It's you know, it's a yeah. very slow buildup. Um, and then once it comes, it's a big explosion of violence. A figure that we don't see stabs him to death with an ice pick. Yeah. And uh, you know, Michael Douglas finally goes, Oh no, when he runs. <laughs> And his, he's like, hmm, it's taking him some yeah, time. His, I should go check on him. Yeah, and the actor is covered with Carol syrup. He's got blood coming out of his artery. And yeah, yeah. so then, it's great. Because Douglas tries to save him, fails. So he's got blood all over his hands. And he's got his gun. It's cool. Ooh, blood on his hands. Yeah, it's cool. And then he sees Beth. In the hallway. to reach into her pocket. For her keychain. And he shoots her. But the way she acts is quite suspicious. The way she looks. Yeah, I don't know. Like. I uh, I think she did it. I really think she did it. Because then there's all this planted evidence that's found afterwards. A wig, the ice pick. And it's like, okay, it was, you know, it was clearly Beth. But then Nick goes to see Catherine. Yeah. And he, okay, so yep. now they're like, he, he's like, let's be together. I want to be with you. So then the movie ends with one last uh explicit sex scene and with this... Catherine's signature move that... <laughs> no seriously she has a signature move and it's like she like leans back and it's like oh man hey mark that's gotta be and she thinks you think she's leaning <laughs> no seriously i don't know like lot logistically how this is even working but you think because every time she goes like puts her arm back to grab the ice pack right and then she's just trying to get comfortable but I don't know. It's like in this last scene, she just like grabs the sheet. Like, right. Okay. Yeah. And then he's talking. Do you think she's messing with him? She's like, I'm going to act like I'm pulling, going to get something here and I'm going to see if he pulls a gun on me. You think? Maybe she does that a few times. She's like, no. okay, he's good. Stabby no. stab. No. No. And then he's talking about like getting married and having kids. Right. And she's like, I don't like kids. He's like, <laughs> fine. We'll just, you know. Do it like rabbits forever. We're giving the G-rated version of the Joe Esterhaz dialogue, by yeah. the way, which is very quotable, but not on this podcast. Yeah. And then it's like, okay. They embrace, they live happily ever after, fade to black, but then fade up. They're still going at it. Camera pans down. Under the bed is a nice pick. And the movie ends right there. Like she just keeps a nice pick under there just for funsies. Yes. Also, you know, you see how often she uses that ice pick. Maybe she just like went upstairs, it rolled under the bed. She's like, where is that ice pick? Where'd it go? She probably has multiple ice picks. Maybe not for stabbing. Maybe just, maybe she likes ice upstairs. Maybe she's got a little, I mean, come on. And plus like, you know, you know, she's into cocaine. Maybe she needs something to help like, you know, cut it up. I can't find my wrist. I'll just use an ice pick. Here we go. Okay. If you think it's Beth, who's the killer, how... Did Beth know to kill Gus the way that Catherine's book and a was non- written? Well, oh, as the, as the book was being written or what's in the book? Yeah, because she, she finishes the book and we know how the killer kills the partner. I'm willing to how go- How does Beth, how does that translate to Beth? Okay, all right. Well, I'm willing to go with what's in the book is a coincidence because it is a classic climax- operative word for this movie and there was an anonymous phone call an anonymous tip that made them go to that hotel to 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 meet because remember he thinks he's meeting like a witness or something and shows up and stabity stab so yeah i think it was beth that beth did the anonymous phone call yes and then but how how is it the same in the book you can't just say coincidence that's too easy it's basic instinct it's San Francisco, and there's like it's according to this movie, there's like seven people. 
in San Francisco. <laughs> not counting the not counting the dancers at the club. <laughs> Yeah, there's only seven people there. And by the way, I gotta say, you know what? The the only thing this movie hates more than straight people and gay people, tourists. Because not only is Nick shot to tourists, remember the part where he goes where they go to the diner and they're like being gross and they're saying gross stuff and they're terrorizing people in the diner. Obviously, tourists. This movie hates people from out of town. <laughs> okay, so you're just gonna go with it's a coincidence and Beth did it. Yes, I. Yeah. Wow. You know, oh, I think the movie sets it up well. Honestly, like I guess I think he, you know, the thing about the ice pick under the bed, it could be taken both ways. Maybe, maybe Beth planted it there. Maybe she planted it. Beth would have had to have been at Catherine's house. Yes, she probably has a key because, as established, they used to be lovers in or college. Beth, this was years ago. That's a cop for Pete's sake. Maybe she snuck into her house while she and while well, well, she and uh, uh, Nick were, you know, at the at the club. Well, She's like sneaking in the house like that. Sure. Dancing in there while everyone's at the club. Maybe maybe she knocked on the door. She had a mustache on cable gar, you know, and, and Roxy answers. Oh, thank you. And he gets her in, puts the ice pick, you know, planted. Look, it's basic instinct. This is not LA confidential. It's okay. Base, it's not Chinatown. It's basic instinct. Okay, but in basic instinct too. Uh. Basic you said you too. said you didn't care about it, but they do say that Catherine's a killer. It's just yeah, the whole movie's about haha. She's still out doing her thing, where she like gets dudes coked up, they have crazy sex, and she kills them. But in basic instinct too, it's not the, the ice pick makes a cameo. It's this weird moment where she's kind of like lovingly looking at her ice pick. <laughs> it's so dumb. Basic instinct two is about auto erotic as- asphyxiation. Oh, remember that? No. We saw Basic Instinct 2 opening day. I couldn't wait to see it. And we saw it. This is the weirdest freaking thing. And I, I'm kind of I'm kind of amazed you still want to be married to me. We saw a double feature of Basic Instinct 2 and Ice Age 2 on the same day. We went from Ice Age 2 to Basic Instinct 2. Okay. And I barely remember either film. Yeah. Though I did see Basic Instinct 2 at Was second time. Was there an ice time. pick in Ice Age? No. Oh. Just okay. an, an iceberg, but not an ice pick. Oh, okay. And less cocaine. Oh, okay. And sexy. <laughs> okay. Though I think Sid the Sloth does dance to some techno music at one point. That's the mm-hmm. one thing they have in common. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now, how many stars did you originally give this movie? I still gave it three stars. You did. It's a sleazy movie. And it's, you know, problematic is one way to put it. Another way, I mean, I would just say it's flawed because the characters only talk about the plot. They're only operating on a plot level. Yeah. And the thing is, the thing with great film noir, whether we're talking about Double Indemnity or L.A. Confidential or The Spanish Prisoner, whatever, whatever you even, or if you want to go like with a sci-fi mix like Blade Runner or The Matrix, those movies succeed because the characters, the stakes are there. You know the characters. You're rooting for the characters. The, I mean, Nick only talks about his coked up adventures with with Catherine Tramell. These characters are only talking about the plot. Yeah, it would be a lot more interesting if you really got to know them. I mean, that's one of the yeah, things they don't about, have a life because side of this case. I mean, you know, like a movie that's far more famous, um, far more famous than Basic Instinct, and even more influential is Fatal Attraction. Mm-hmm. And that movie, like you really got to know those characters, and that's what makes that movie tragic. There's no tragedy here. I don't care when Gus dies. <laughs> I'm not, you know, it's like it, it, the thing is like I thought about sure. I was thinking about this today. If if it turns out that Sharon Stone is the killer of this movie, I don't think she is. But if that's really how this movie ends and she actually does stab him to death, would you care? But like, oh, it's a shocking way to end the movie, but no. Yeah. Because he's awful. I, I'm more shocked that she doesn't stab him at the end, actually. Well, I mean, if the sequel is any indication, at some point, I think I think they established that he's just. I think she even says something like he was he wasn't enough for me or whatever. I guess she just got bored of him. Well, that checks out. Yeah, I think she gets bored with people. I think she does. Okay. But yeah, Basic Instinct Two is operating in a world where Catherine Tramell is this killer who just keeps on getting away with it. Mm. They just, I think they probably did that. Maybe they really did think that Beth was the killer, but they wanted that Basic Instinct 2 money. Well, I mean, Basic Instinct was designed to have, you know, it it was designed that, I mean, that's one of the things about the script that's so clever. As a murder mystery, it really is, 
it's providing possibilities. It's not going just in one direction. I mean, and it's also a murder mystery like another movie, I believe that Joe Esther Haas also wrote called Jagged Edge. And Jagged Edge ends in a way that only the final scene tells you definitively who the killer is. But I don't think Basic Instinct does that. Again, it's like it's it's an ice pick that's not being used. Yeah. So. Mm. Okay. I like this movie. I do. And I remember the day Blockbuster Video released it. Because I remember going to Blockbuster. My dad really wanted. My my father was a big fan of this movie. And I was too young to see it. But I, I would hear a lot about it from my father. So I remember going with him to Blockbuster Video in Kahului. I remember walking in there. And they had like, I guess the company had a sent. A whole wall of them. A whole wall of them yeah and it was one of these things you know all the all the all the boxes no video cassettes was but um behind it like everybody had yeah. rented it. oh yeah and the other thing was that they had this thing though that every every blockbuster video received all over the world they had this video cassette and it was weird because it was like a basic instinct promo video and it showed the car chase scenes it showed a piece of the interrogation and it showed the dance scene and that's it. So it was weird. It's like it was like these scenes of Basic Instinct they were playing in the store as you walk around. Like, wow, I'm seeing Basic Instinct, but it was like the PG version of it, the, the airplane version. Exactly. And by the yeah. way, they showed it on television. Oh. They did show it on TV, and like, it was an hour shorter. <laughs> there were a lot. Let's just say there were a lot of commercials. <laughs> Lots. Of, I saw like the Downey commercials, and you know, and and Morris the Cat a lot. So mm. yeah. Okay. How would you change the ending? I would um I wouldn't kill Beth. I wow. would have the two of them get away and then we're they're on like a secluded island together, then I would have her kill him. Have Catherine kill him? No, I would have Beth kill him. Oh. I Wait, would, so Beth and Nick go to a secluded island? I would rather that that Nick kills Catherine Tramell because I think that's what Beth wants more than anything. Uh. I would because uh, because honestly, I think that Catherine Tramell is messed up. I think totally. that she's damaged goods. I think that she is a novelist who has this very self-destructive way of creating her narratives, and that she invites all these very damaged people in her life to feel a sense of of sisterhood and camaraderie. I don't think that she's a killer, but I think that Beth is insanely jealous that Nick is with this really intriguing person that she once had an affair with. So uh, I would like to, I would have it end where the opposite, where Catherine shows up in the building, Nick plugs her because he thinks that she's going for a gun. She isn't. Um, the evidence points to Catherine. The movie ends where it's like, oh, okay, Beth and I are going to live happily ever after. They go to some secluded place and so there's a graphic sex scene. You have to end it that way. And then she <laughs> takes nice pick and puts it in his eye and the movie ends. Yeah. So because, Beth is the only one who gets away. Yes. I'm fine with that because I'm okay with her being the villain because it's satisfying that way because Nick sucks. Catherine Tramell is awful. These people are awful. I'm okay. She would have preferred that I'm fine. Ending. I'm fine with Gene Triplehorn being the one to make it out of this movie because mm -hmm. uh, like the nicer people, not all of them, but some of the nicer characters really die in horrible ways in this movie. Yeah. So I would enjoy a more definitive this is the killer situation. I I would like the killer to win in this case. In this case, <laughs> I think it's Gene Triplehorn. I've never believed it to be Sharon Stone. So, yeah, I, I'm kind of mad that Nick gets like a happy ending. In more ways than one. <laughs> that was not on purpose. <laughs> well done. Somewhere right now, Joe Esterhaus is applauding you. Okay. Do you like this movie or no? Um, you know. Would you ever watch it with your mom? No. I would never watch it with my mom. <laughs> um. I liked it, but like you said, it's like a lot of graphic sex and then a lot of like talking about the plot. Yeah, so, but I, I do think the plot is pretty engaging. I mean, I think it's a really riveting mystery. Yeah, it is a good mystery, but yeah. it's like, it's a lot of characters like going places and right. you're like- you But have, it's San Francisco. It's a visually stunning but film. But you're in the car with them. You're like doing a lot of driving with them. You are. So, I don't but know. It looks great. It's cool. As a travelogue, as a okay. movie that's in love with San Francisco, the discotheque in particular. <laughs> yeah. I I didn't like it as much as I think I did maybe the first time. And I think I do enjoy Fatal Attraction more. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Well, that's a great film. 
Um, I think that Verhoeven is a better director than Adrian Lyne, but I think Adrian Lyne, because it's about emotional intimacy as well as bedroom intimacy, mm-hmm. and the stakes are big there because and- it's a guy who's married to a nice woman, yeah, his has wife a beautiful awesome. little girl, and you know, it's like trying to keep that marriage together where it's like. Nick breaks up with Beth. He doesn't break up with Beth. He ends up with Sharon Stone. It's like these people are going to sleep with whoever they want to, and they do anyway. So it's like, so the emotional stakes are not there. If anything, these characters are all very sociopathic with their emotions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So in that way, like you said, in the end, you don't really care what happens to them. Yeah. Because, well, I mean, again, like they're, we've seen, I mean, they're interesting characters, no question, but they're also terrible. Yeah. So exactly. Yeah. So I think, I think we did it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> do you have any, By it, you mean this episode? Yes. 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 Do you have any final thoughts? Uh, you know, if you watch basic instinct, um, uh, watch the R rated version. Yes. Trust me. Yes. It's uh it's not a date movie, despite mm-hmm. what you may have heard. And uh, Paul Verhoeven has made better films. One of which is called RoboCop and the other one is called Total Recall. But uh, Michael Douglas is riveting in this movie, although his best performance, I think, for in, in during this era, I'd still say is The War of the Roses. Oh, yeah. Sharon yeah. Stone is terrific in this movie. She is compelling. It's not just the nudity. She's really good in this movie. No, I'm not mean, just the nudity, she, folks. If there's one scene in her career that people always go to, it's the interrogation scene because of the nudity. But no, she's she's excellent in this movie. I think it's a great performance. She established that she's a great actress with the movie she did, Casino, where she was nominated for Best Actress. So I don't think she has anything to prove anymore. But I mean, there was a period where like people kind of sneered at her being taken seriously as like an A-list actress. And I really feel like the fact that she's so good in this is one of the reasons why this movie works a lot better than it should. Yeah. This movie could have just been tawdry crap, but no, it's elegant tawdry crap. Yes. It is an A plus B movie. I did feel like when she was in her dialogue scenes that she was very compelling. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, you know, we were talking about Madonna. I mean, Madonna did a movie like this a couple of years later called, it was a year later, it was called Body of Evidence. And the movie sucks. You know, even Madonna, who like is kind of the model for Catherine Trammell. Madonna couldn't do it. Willem Dafoe was the co-star. I mean, that movie does not work. Basic Instinct, it's sleazy with a capital S, but I think it still works. Okay. It's also very controversial and problematic. (laughs) So approach with caution. All right. Well, I think that concludes our discussion of Basic Instinct. Thanks, everyone. 